So Representative Melanie Stansberry, our Democratic candidate for CD1, we're thrilled to death to get some of your time tonight. Um, if you'd like to take a few minutes for opening remarks, and then uh, whenever you're ready, I've got a few questions that we'd like to ask on behalf of the executive committee and the rest of our membership about your role, obviously, in DC, when you win, and our access to you. So ma'am, that's all yours. All right. Well, good evening, Veterans Caucus. It's wonderful to see you all. Um, it's an honor to be able to be here tonight, and I see some old friends who I haven't seen in a while, so it's great to see you. Um, I'm your Democratic nominee for the 1st Congressional District, and I'm running to be our next Congresswoman because as a Native New Mexican, I believe so strongly in our people. I believe that when we have the resources and tools and capacity to do so, we thrive, we conquer, we do amazing things. And I just believe so deeply in our communities. And that's why I'm running for Congress, to serve our communities um, in much the same way why people, you know, step up to serve our country in the armed services as federal employees, as state employees, as tribal employees. We do this work because we care, because we want to help our communities and because we believe in them. Um, I um, have not served in the military myself. My stepmom is a VA nurse and has spent her entire career working in the VA system and um, retired from Walter Reed where she was a nurse liaison and helped to um, transfer our veterans from uh, active duty into the veteran system. And so um, I am very familiar with many of the triumphs and struggles of the VA system and um, my commitment is to work with our active duty members, to work with our veterans, to make sure that we are strengthening and growing the services that are available, addressing the health care and mental health and housing and other needs of our veterans and, and partnering with um, all of our service members and, and their families and our veterans to make sure that people have the resources that they need and that we're celebrating and honoring their service. So um, I'm honored to be here today and I'm grateful for your service and I'm here to, to answer questions and have a conversation. So please take it away. Thank you so much. And that's such a good point. People serve in uniform, out of uniform, and in so many different capacities. Um, Michelle is on tonight, Michelle Peacock. She's a VA nurse and um, you know, it, it's hard. That really is the front lines very often. So thanks so much again for your time. Let me start out the questions. Um, would you serve on the House Armed Services Committee? I would be honored to serve on armed services. Um, people keep asking me which committees I'm going to serve on and I don't know yet, partly because, well, first I have to win the race, <laughs> of course. And secondly, um, I have to speak to leadership. It's not clear whether they'll, they'll um, plug me into a vacancy where you know we know our Congresswoman Holland was serving or if they'll assign me to different committees. So I'm not sure yet how I'll be assigned to committees, but if I'm asked to serve in that role, I would be honored to do so. It's such an important committee to our state and, um, and it would be a tremendous honor. Terrific, thank you. And we're asking these assuming you're gonna get elected because you've got a group of about 350 in this caucus that are working very, very hard um, for you. So let me ask the second question. Do you support replenishing the military budget for deferred maintenance at the Air Force bases because the last administration rated that uh, for use of building a wall. Absolutely. So um, one of the things that um, I did in a former life was work as a budget analyst uh, in the White House. I worked in the White House Office of Management and Budget and um, I was a budget analyst for the Department of Interior and um, you know, every federal agency, whether it's our Department of Defense or DOE or Department of Interior installations have massive amounts of deferred maintenance and infrastructure needs. And I think it's appalling and um, 
you know, violates just basic tenets of separation of powers that the previous president used funds that were intended for um, maintaining our agencies for the purposes of building a border wall, which was not only ineffective, but um, a waste of colossal amounts of taxpayer dollars. So I absolutely support uh, making sure that we restore those dollars and that they're used for the purposes for which they were intended. Excellent, thank you. Uh, third question, do you support the Senate bill that moves cases of alleged sexual assault out of the chain of command? Yes, absolutely. And um, I very much support the efforts that have happened in the wake of the Vanessa Guillen tragedy. Um, you know, it's really critical that we ensure that there are processes for all service members and veterans to feel safe uh, in the line of duty and to take um, any challenges that they're having um, you know, out of, the, out of the chain of command so that they can address those issues. So um, I very much support that bill. And um, I have also committed that once the bill is reintroduced in the House, if it's not too late by the time I get there, that I would co-sponsor the bill in the House. Good, and that's the way to talk when I get there. <laughs> All right, question number four. Do you support the US troop withdrawal from Afghanistan? And if so, what type of aid, if any, do you think the US should continue to send? I do support the withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan um, and the president's approach of taking a thoughtful planned approach to doing so. I think that we have to stand with our troops, support our troops and their families and ensure that everyone gets home safely. But I don't believe that we should be funding and putting our troops in harm's way for endless wars year after year. Um, and so I do support the withdrawal of troops, but we do need to be providing aid. I know that you know, one of the big fears in um, our removal of troops in Afghanistan is um, issues around voting, around women's rights, around access to education. And I believe that humanitarian aid and diplomatic approaches to these issues are crucial to maintaining the security of these places and also our international security. So I do support some continued presence for humanitarian reasons, as well as continued aid to ensure that there is that support for democracy and basic human rights um, as our troops are coming home. Yeah, I agree completely. Thank you. Um, question number five, how will you engage with leaders in veterans organizations in New Mexico to remain apprised of important issues and how accessible will you be to those leaders, present company included? Absolutely. Well, I believe the best way to have the public and stakeholders and community members engaged in public policy is for them to have a seat at the table directly. And so my hope is that as, I, as I'm standing up my congressional office, um, you know, we will continue the legacy that our former Congress people have had of having wounded warriors working in the office and helping to do direct liaisoning with both active duty and veterans organizations. Um, and also doing regular consultations with um, different organizations. And I don't know yet what that would look like, but I, I would hope that our Democratic Veterans Caucus and different you know, organizations that represent veterans and serve veterans, that we can have some sort of regular um, stakeholder engagement where people can have a seat at the table, share about the things that are opportunities and struggles and then we can translate that into budget asks. Um, you know, we, we now have the opportunity to ask for, um, for individual budget asks again in Congress. And um, I very much believe that one of the most important things we can do is advocating for expanding um, the VA budget and expanding resources for VA access here in um, Albuquerque and in the satellite areas. 
So those are all some of the things that um, I'm hoping to do, but I also will look to you all um, for recommendations about how to best do those consultations and how to keep people um, engaged and how we can best make sure that people's voices are heard in the process. Good, thank you. And certainly um, I know that we've got a lot of amazing talent in this caucus. Uh, I guess the pay is just right. And we would <laughs> certainly be happy to work with your staff or anybody else. Um, that's really encouraging to hear. We had good access with uh, Congresswoman Deb Holland and hope to continue the same. Thank you. Okay, um, next question. What is your view on privatizing privatization of the VA? I am adamantly opposed to it. <laughs> and I'll just say, you know, I, I said in my opening remarks that my stepmom worked at the VA and um, towards the end of her career, I think it would have been around the 2000, I want to say 15, 16 time period. Um, she, she had actually been working in the polytrauma unit at Walter Reed, which is the unit where wounded warriors who come back from active duty, who have brain injuries and things like that, um, she had been working there for almost a decade at that point. And um, doctors actually get rotated out of that unit almost every 18 months because it's such a traumatic unit to work in. And she needed to um, move into, um, you know, a job where it was less stressful. And so she took an assignment in VA headquarters and she worked there for a couple of years. And um, I got to, you know, through her experience, really see um, some of the, you know, what's going on under the hood inside of VA headquarters. And I think that the really big challenge for the VA over the last several administrations is that um, the need for leadership, sustained funding, and really systematic management reforms to make sure that services on the ground improve and that we're making those infrastructure investments and we're getting service providers and healthcare providers and all of that on the ground is as much a funding and a management issue as anything. And it gets politicized by Republicans. Um, and, uh, you know, it, this is kind of the drum, drum beat that happens that somehow privatization is going to fix what are really managerial and budgetary problems. What we need is strong leadership, good management, reforms, and really strong, robust funding that actually re reaches our veterans and our service members on the ground. So I will be a strong partner um, as much as possible from the congressional side to make sure that that is happening and advocating for New Mexico's veterans in the process. Fantastic. As, as you know, we've got 11% of the population of this state are veterans. And uh, some of them don't have transportation to the single veterans hospital in the fifth largest state of the US. And uh, not all of them are on computers. So telemedicine doesn't work for them and we can't forget them. Um, next question, would you, push, would you support a 10% cut in defense spending, including New Mexico national labs like Sandia and Los Alamos and military bases? So I answered yes to this question um, during the primary with regard to the overall budget for the military, but I don't support it as a cut to New Mexico's labs and installations. And so I'd love to kind of explain my thinking and, and rationale. So um, as I mentioned, I worked as a budget analyst on the federal budget. And in particular, I worked as a budget analyst on research and development. And when you work on the federal budget at that level, what you see is that there is a tremendous amount of federal money that gets spent, that just goes out the door to contractors. And this is across all different agencies, but particularly pronounced in, in DOD spending. And we literally see billions and billions and billions of dollars get spent on weapon systems, for example, built by military contractors that literally never even get used. There's 
planes that sit in hangars, there's missiles and defense systems and all kinds of things that gets developed. There's billions of dollars spent on research and development on computer systems and things like that that literally never see the light of day. They're never used in military operations and they're never used in civilian um, uses either. I think that it is possible it, within the overall federal budget to reduce spending, wasteful spending uh, of that nature and re-divert it into research and development on things that is critical, like addressing climate change and clean energy and addressing our drought crisis and um, you know, uh, retrofitting a lot, of, a lot of the military's operations um, could be made more sustainable, um, improving you know, um, military installations, um, overall infrastructure and, um, and ecology because it's a huge proportion of our, of our public lands are also military lands. So what I support is diverting those resources into what I consider public good. So, you know, research and development that actually supports peace missions, that supports environmental sustainability and that can be utilized for civilian purposes. And I think that we can divert those resources and still keep our country safe because I think there's a huge amount of those resources that are not even utilized to keep our country safe. It's just a lack of um, courage on the part of appropriators um, in Congress to really make sure that that money gets used for its highest purpose. And I think this is, you know, um, this came up in the debate that was aired on Sunday as my opponent was trying to use this answer against me because it wasn't what I said or what my intention was. Um, I think that we can actually increase funding in our labs and our research labs, our Air Force research labs in New Mexico by putting our scientists and engineers and, you know, our technicians to work solving public good problems like climate change and drought and clean energy because we have the greatest minds in the world literally living in New Mexico. So not only do I not support at cutting that funding, I think we should be increasing that funding. I think we should be spending that money on clean energy and climate change. That's a wonderful answer. So certainly not a 10% across the board cut, which does a lot of damage to some important smaller programs, but to take money that is not needed, that is actually wasted and re-divert to the common good, including climate action. And that takes me right into the next question. Would you, and it, it sounds like we know the answer, but I want to ask it. Uh, will you work to turn our military industrial complex into a climate action industrial complex? Basically, okay. shift, focus, shift focus from excess production of planes, ships, tanks, or bombs, and put it into solar panels, wind turbines, batteries, controls, and then of course the needed R&D. Yes, absolutely. I've never heard it called that, but I love it. And, you know, I'll just say, so my background's in water. I work in water, water resources management, and specifically I work on helping to translate climate models into um, water management models that then we can use for um, policy and for addressing our water resources needs. And I've actually worked on several projects with scientists at Sandia Labs. And, um, you know, I can tell you that literally, quite literally, some of the best hydrologic modelers in the world sit at Sandia Labs, and they were originally hired to do groundwater modeling um, for um, nuclear storage projects. And when those projects got shelved, they had to get sort of repurposed for other projects. And so they started building conflict resolution models. And we now provide that the United States is foreign aid to countries all over the world to help them do transboundary water conflict modeling. And I actually worked as a contractor on a project uh, with those modelers. And we now use the models that they developed for helping manage the Rio Grande. So not only can we do this, this is something that our labs are really good at up at Los Alamos. They have the best fire models literally in the country. 
So we can put those minds to solving our country and New Mexico's and our world's greatest problems. And we already have a track record of doing that. And I know for a fact that many of the scientists at our labs would love to be working on those kinds of missions. And so I know we can do this. And, and I think that um, the Biden administration hopefully will also help to prioritize bringing those dollars here to do that. That's excellent. And, you know, I remember from my time on active duty, um, the Navy was really looking at the issue of destabilization from climate instability and climate crisis. So it is a national security concern. Yeah. And if we can uh, not get into water wars or any other kind of wars or not have massive populations become climate refugees, and disrupting neighboring uh, nations, it's gonna be a, a huge benefit. So sometimes you don't see the good that, that, uh, that you do because it's a negative, you don't have a war, you, know, you don't have an insurrection, but, but I think that's a wonderful idea. So Melanie, you've answered uh, all of our questions. Um, we had about 10 people last night that were giving us some ideas. I really like the questions that they asked and I really love your answers. Um, and I'd like to thank you. Um, I'd like to, to close and say that we are endorsing you and Yay. we'll be sending you our endorsement. We really are all out there um, to support you. You're gonna do a wonderful job. And I'd like to give you a couple minutes to close. Thank you. Well, I'm just, I'm so touched and honored, honestly. Um, I'm gonna get emotional. I get very emotional these days about everything, but you know, the thing that is so awesome and extraordinary about being on the campaign trail and getting to see so many of our beautiful people in this state is that you get to hear people's stories, you get to hear about people's service, and you get to see how the people of New Mexico step up and serve. And I can't think of a community that's more important to service in our community than our veterans and our active duty military. So thank you for what you do to lift up the voices um, of our veterans and, and, and service members and their families. And I'm truly touched and honored to be endorsed and let's go win this race. <laughs> So let's go win this race. Absolutely. <laughs> All, right. All right. Thank okay, you. Okay, well, we're good to go. Thank you so much for joining us and good luck. Couple weeks All to right. go. Bye. Three weeks. Don't forget to vote. <laughs> Already did. Yep. All right. Already did. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.